Uh, hi, welcome everyone. I'm Jonas Oberhauser from Huawei Tristan Research Center. And I'm talking to today about the Linux kernel memory model. Um, and when the Linux kernel memory model was published in the scientific um, paper, they titled it Frightening Young Children and Disconcerting Adults, which reminds me of some old fairy tales I had to listen to as a young German child. But after getting to know the Linux kernel memory model a little bit better, I felt actually it's more like some cool futuristic thing than some frightening um, scary fairy tale. And I want to maybe tell a few things about the Linux kernel memory model to share that kind of view. And uh, at the same time, I want to answer a lot of questions I have been getting about weak memory models whenever I talk to people in industry about it. Um, and the first of these questions is, uh, why weak memory model exists at all? Why can't we just kind of ignore the whole thing? And um, historically, we all know Moore's law, and some people are saying it's getting slower, but if you look at the actual transistor count, it's still growing kind of exponentially. It's just that the single-threaded performance isn't keeping up with that development, and instead what the higher transistor count gives us is more processors. Um, so basically, we have at the one hand side that this multi quadrized performance, on the other hand, uh, if you look at the ratio between performance um, of the CPU core and the performance of the memory in terms of bandwidth and latency, you see that that latency is also falling exponentially behind. So latency is getting much worse uh, from the viewpoint of the processor. At the same time, performance is still getting better. And how is that making sense? The answer is, in order to keep this kind of throughput high, we need to execute memory operations out of order and not wait for that long latency. So if you look, for example, um, here at this instruction stream, which are the instructions that the processor sees uh, in this order, um, we might have some stores, some loads, maybe some arithmetic stuff, and some branch uh, conditions in there. Um, and if we execute them actually on the, on the hardware, this is not executed in order at all. It's executed in some kind of parallel uh, way. And so what we get is actually more like a two-dimensional picture of time um, and instructions where we see that some logical operations that are started quite early and are early in the instruction stream actually completed much later. And this gives some interesting effects. For example, let's say we store to some variable and then later we load from the same variable. Um, we're able to see the value of that load before the store that writes that value completes. And this is called forwarding. And another interesting thing we see is that if we have a branch condition which is evaluated based on a former load, we don't have to wait for that load to complete before executing the code that comes after the branch, this speculation. And these effects, they can hide this kind of out of order parallelism inside of the um, CPU from the programmer as long as the programmer writes only single threaded code. And I think that's why most people might not even be like thinking about this at all. Um, but what happens if you have a multiprocessor program? For example, here with two CPUs, um, one writing first to Y and then to X, and the other one reading first from X and then reading from Y, and doing this with a loop to make sure that by the time it starts reading the Y value, the X value has already been updated. And maybe the processor thinks, well, uh, the, the programmer thinks, if he writes the code like this, he's guaranteed that the execution looks something like this first, the two CPUs at the same time execute the first instruction. One of them writes to Y, the other one loads from X, and because X hasn't been updated yet, it loads the zero value. Um, then the, X, the processors in parallel execute the next operation, writing to X, and the other one is evaluating the branch condition, which of course fails because it read X equals zero in the first iteration. And then the second processor starts another iteration of the loop, reads one this time because the value of X has been updated. Um, completes the loop execution and reads the value of Y finally as one. And maybe programmers think, okay, every, it should always be like this. And on some processors like x86, you will see only this kind of behavior. But if you look at weak memory architectures like ARM, Power, Risk v the answer can be quite different. And the reason is that the store to Y can be reordered with the store to X and the load from X can be reordered in a sense with the load to y in, in the sense that we speculatively guess that the value is going to be one, already execute the loads that come after the loop and then see some out of date value. And the only way to prevent this is by adding so-called barriers 
So two most important barriers are store release and load acquire, which basically impose some kind of ordering constraint, both on the processor as well as on the compiler, to make sure that the stores uh, of the first thread and the loads of the second thread happen in order here. And when you add these kind of barriers, you can make sure um, that you will always read the value of y equal one and never y equal zero. And then people might say, okay, this weak memory model, ex uh, this weak memory exists, but why do we need a model? Why do we need to think about it like in some form of abstraction? We could just do it like Calvin's dad suggests in this awesome comic, where Calvin asks, how do they know the load limit on bridges? And Calvin's dad says, well, they just drive bigger and bigger trucks over the bridge until it breaks. Right? And this is how a lot of software is developed, and why don't we just do the same thing for, uh, for this kind of concurrent software? Um, of course, this is works on my machinism, and we can see how that uh, worked um, with one very concrete example from the Linux kernel. So the code here that's too small for you to see is the QSpinLog code from 2015. And this code was written by complete experts, very, very smart people. And if you run this code on x86 processors, it will always work. And if you run it on RISC-V processors from 2015, it will always work. And if you run it on ARM processors, well, as long as you're not using the big server machines, I think it will always work. But if you run it on PowerPC, it will uh, most of the time work, but sometimes it just hangs, okay? So now we see this code, um, which is extremely complicated concurrent code with lots of crazy stuff happening in there, and we have to identify where's the hang. And um, because most programmers don't even have maybe access to this kind of PowerPC machine to see this kind of strange behavior happening themselves, they might not even realize that the bug is in the code. And as a result, the code was not fixed for three years. So this hang was in the Linux kernel for three years inside of the lock itself. And now let's try to debug this code. And um, I've done already the most important part of the work for you. I've cut that down to like a very small part of the code where the problem is, okay? And the way we debug code is, well, we maybe get like the watchdog to trigger that the kernel is hanging without doing anything. The, kernel, the, the watchdog creates a core dump. And we look at the core dump and we try to guess back what happened, okay? And if you look at the core dump, um, we see, okay, let, let's go through the code first. So we have two threads here. One of them is the current lock holder, that's thread two. And one of them is trying to acquire the lock, that's thread one. And the value of the lock variable is basically telling us a kind of queue, tail pointer to a queue of the threads that want to enter the critical section. And currently, um, in the beginning, the, the thread that wants to, that entered the critical section is thread two. So the current tail pointer is pointing to thread two's node N2. And what thread one wants to do is it wants to insert its own node N1 into that queue using this atomic exchange, which reads the current value, which is N2, and stores its own value N1 into it. And then it wants to go to the previous owner, which is N2, and tell it, hey, by the way, the next guy to enter the critical section is me. So please, once you're done with the critical section, let me go in. And it does this by writing this next pointer to its own node, N1. Originally, the next pointer is now, and thread two is waiting until that next pointer is set, and it will get the next pointer, N1. Um, and then thread one simply waits until thread two says, okay, I'm done with the critical section, you're good to go. And it does that by looking at its own locked bit. As long as the locked bit is zero, it means someone else is currently in the critical section. When the locked bit is set to one, it means, okay, it's my turn to go into the critical section. And that's what thread two does. After it sees the next pointer to be set to N1, it will store the locked bit uh, to one. And that will allow thread one to enter the critical section. Now, if you look at the core dump, we see a couple of things happened. Um, thread one, as expected, set the locked value to N1, um, it set N2's next pointer to itself, thread two read that and left its code completely, so it already executed the store setting the lock bit to one, but thread one is somehow still stuck in its loop waiting for the lock bit to be set to one and it's somehow zero. Okay, and now I can ask the audience, do you have any idea where I need to insert the barrier to, to fix this code? Okay, someone has an idea. You can shout it and I can try to repeat. Which one? On the right. You want to change this part. So, no, that doesn't help. Actually, where we need to insert the barrier is this right one needs to be a store release. 
And you can see this is almost impossible to guess. So you did a good effort. I have never had anyone guess correctly where the, where the barrier needs to be put. Um, OK, and, and we changed this right once to store release, and the bug disappears on the Compang ARM server, for example. OK, what does that tell us, right? Did we really fix the bug? Is it just maybe we added some complicated code there that makes it slow enough that it happens to work? Yeah? Is it correct for all ARM chips or just the one I tested on? We don't know. And that's why we need some memory model. And maybe the better way for that to answer his son's question here is to give an answer like this. Okay? The way we know the, the load limit is we have a model of, of a bridge. Okay? And we use that model to, to do some kind of like stress, uh, stress analysis and so on. And yeah. And what is this kind of model? Well, it's an abstraction of the, of the bridge. And it helps us make predictions. And in the case of the bridge model, it abstracts away from some intermolecular forces and whatever, and allows us to predict what we in the industry call inconvenient user experience. And for weak memory models, we want to abstract away from like the concrete gate level design of the architecture, from all of the crazy optimizations GCC can do to memory operations. And we also want to predict some inconvenient user experience. Um, and so because of that, yeah, what's the question now? And because of that, uh, a group of very, very cool people sat together and said, okay, let's make a Linux kernel memory model. And basically they tried to create this unified abstraction of many different architectures because Linux has to run kind of everywhere, of compiler optimizations that do crazy stuff with your code. And of course, combining the kind of two worlds from the mathematics uh, point of view where the model should be like really correct and be reasonable and meaningful and of the systems people who want to make sure the model actually helps us predict real stuff and not it's just some abstract nonsense that people cannot use. And then in order to make sure that there's like the kind of marriage between these things is really working out, they created thousands of test cases, I think over 5,000, um, that highlight different use scenarios and so on and made sure that the model predicts the right thing on all of these thousands of test cases. And now I want to show a little bit what that model looks like. And when I created these slides, I, I realized I made a big blunder by actually trying to cram two weeks of weak memory model lectures into 10 minutes of a talk. And then I cut out most of it, but it's still a little bit bumpy. But let me start first by trying to, ex to remind ourselves of the sequential model of execution maybe most of us have in mind for, for concurrent software. And in that model, you have the different threads. Each thread has a position in the code where it's currently executing, indicated by this arrow here. And initially, they're, of course, at the start of their code. And then in some order, they execute operations. For example, maybe thread one first executes its first operation, sets the lock bit to zero. Um, then it tries to do the the, this exchange tail operation. That's an interlocked operation consisting of a read, reading the current value and a store updating the value to itself, and they are kind of interlocked, so nothing should happen between these two operations. And then it writes, and then it starts spinning, but of course, because thread two hasn't yet set the locked bit, it will just be stuck there. And then thread two will leave its loop, reading the updated value of N1 that was written by thread one. Thread one maybe spins a little bit more, and then thread two sets the locked bit to one, and thread one can leave. So this is one possible execution written here as a sequence of memory operations. Um, and there are, of course, many other possible executions of this code. Each of them has a different sequence. So for example, here's a sequence where thread two starts spinning a little bit earlier um, and sees a null pointer for a while. Uh, or here's one where, where thread two starts reading the next pointer, immediately reads the N1, which will be written later, and then um, performs a store release. Then thread one sets the locked bit to zero, um, that's the exchange and so on, and in the end keeps spinning forever. And I'm happy many of you have very concerned faces because what I said makes no sense, because actually it's not possible for this read ones to read the value of N1 that is written actually much later. And so if you want to like make a general definition of what is a sequential execution, sequentially consistent execution, um, we could say it's a sequence of memory operations with some conditions. Not every sequence makes sense. First of all, each read has to see the current value. And that is the condition that was violated in this nonsensical execution I just showed. Secondly, operations of each thread have to follow the program order. And third, interlocked operations are atomic. 
And now here's some lingo that people in the formal methods community use for this kind of stuff. They call these conditions axioms. Okay, it's just a word you have to, to remember. Whenever you have these kind of conditions, they call them axioms. And knowing this, we can also start defining what's a LKMM execution. What does LKMM consider an execution? And the main point is that instead of you looking at an execution as a sequence of memory operations, LKMM looks at an execution as a graph of memory operations. So, and I, I go into some more example later. Um, and then there's some axioms as well. For example, each read has to read from a write to the same location. So in this graph, you cannot have some read to X reading from a write that wrote to Y or something like that. And then there are some axioms that read like the happens before relation is acyclic, the propagates before relation is acyclic, whatever those mean, right? We don't know what that means right now. Um, and there are lots of these axioms. Um, and then uh, maybe you didn't notice because I very, very skillfully hid it between these Egyptian hieroglyphs, um, but what you have there is not some message written by the aliens that built the pyramids, um, but this is actually part of the definition of the Linux kernel memory model. And there you can see they define what these relations mean using some strange syntax that I'll try to explain very briefly uh, in a second. And they say, for example, here HB is defined as this and this, and HB is this happens before relation, and then they say acyclic HB, which means the happens before relation acyclic. So this would be the second axiom here. And now let's try to, to understand these strange writings here. So as I said, a graph um, is the model of the execution. And in the graph, we have nodes and edges, of course. And then edges are the operations. So here are all of the nodes of one particular execution. And the edges between these nodes are relations between the events. For example, there's the int relation. Int means internal, which relates any two events that come from the same thread. So in this case, for example, this exchange tail operation and the load acquire operation came from the same thread. So there is an edge, an arrow, going from one to the other, and that arrow is labeled int. And of course, this exchange tail operation here comes from the same thread as itself. So there's an arrow going to itself, and so on. So you can see there's actually a lot of them. It looks kind of like a Christmas tree or something. Um, and because it looks so, so confusing, usually when we write these graphs, we don't write all of these edges, we just keep them in our head. And there's another one external that relates all of the events of different threads. Um, and there's something called program order, which is really, really important. Program order basically relates the events of the same thread in the order in which they're seen in the instruction stream, which may not be the order in which they're actually executed. Okay, and here we usually write only the directly next one. Okay, the next important class of relations or edges between these events are the ones that connect events to the same location. Um, and there are three, the first one is reads from, and it starts from the write that provides the value and goes to the read that reads that value. So here we read the one, which means we read from this store, so we have the read from edge like this. And there are lots of them, of course, because there are lots of reads. Then there's coherence, which tells us the order in which things are being overwritten. So we have the initial write, which is being overwritten by this, which is being overwritten by this, so we get all of these errors. And then we have from reads, which tells us when a read is reading some more out-of-date value. And you don't have to remember all of these right now. All you have to remember is these kind of orangey, reddish ones are basically telling us the order of the events to the same location in kind of a logical order, okay? Um, and then the next kind of edge that is really relevant for, this kind of, for understanding these models are the so-called event types or tags, and they basically are, are cycles on node, on memory operations that have a certain kind of property or form. So for example, this one is a read. So there will be the R tag going in a, so in a loop from itself to itself. And there are a couple of them. There's reads, writes. Uh, I won't go through all of them. Um, another very important one, though, is the marked one. And this marked one differentiates between accesses that use LKMM primitives, like exchange tail, write once, read once, and the plain accesses that you write in a normal C program, like n1 sub locked equal zero is just a plain access. It's not marked with any kind of um, LKMM primitive. And this is important because these LKMM primitives, even if they do nothing else, they prevent a lot of compiler optimizations and therefore allow the LKMM to be defined very, very precisely. But the unmarked accesses, all kinds of crazy compiler optimizations are possible there. And therefore, the LKMM makes very, very little predictions about them. 
Okay. And another important type are the release operations, which provide some kind of ordering with the preceding operations. Okay. And then there's something like a regular expression language used to define other kinds of edges. So, for example, there's AND, which defines edges whenever both subrelations hold. Then there's override, which holds. Uh, then there's this pipe, which means one or the other. And then there's the semicolon, which means first one and then the other. And you don't need to remember any of these in detail, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the memory model kind of definitions and stuff look like so that you have a chance, if you ever want to like, read it or, or someone talks about it, to have an idea in your head of what these things mean. Okay. And then we can look at this example from before of the HB definition defined in LKMM. And what it means is you have a marked axis followed by one of three options, either something called PPO, which means preserve program order and tells us anything that is ordered by a barrier, or a read from external, or um, this kind of complicated thing that we don't talk about today. And then the second line here defines one of the axioms saying that HB has to be acyclic. And we'll try to go through an example like that in, in a little bit slower time. So um, first, we have here a marked axis because it's using the right ones, LKM and primitive, and not just the plain axis. Then we have a read from external because it's a read from and between different threads. And then we have another marked loop here because the other axis that is reading from it is also marked using the read ones, LKM and primitive. And because of that, we have this HB edge. And using the same kind of reasoning, we can also show that there's an HB edge here and an HB edge here. And so we have these three HB edges. And we can follow these edges um, and ask the question, do we ever get like, back to the starting point? And that is what acyclic means. Uh, we can never get back to the starting point. And what it, what the, the way to understand the axiom is, if we can ever get to the starting point following these kind of HB edges, it means the graph cannot happen, which means that any bugs that occur in this graph cannot happen according to the LKMM. So this kind of axiom really gives us a prediction of the Linux kernel memory model. And all of the other axioms can be understood in the same way. And now we get back to the part that I think more people should pay attention to. So now if we want to use the LKMM, basically one way to do it is we think of an inconvenient scenario, like for example, an alien attack. Okay? And then we construct all the graphs in which this kind of inconvenient scenario would occur. And then we try to find the HB edges in this graph by manually reading through that huge definitions that are there in the Linux kernel memory model. And when we find these edges, we can look whether we can ever reach back to the same point. And if we can, then we know um, that this scenario cannot happen in reality. And this is the case for all of these tiny examples here. These blue edges here are the HP edges. Each of them form a cycle. So all of these graphs here cannot happen in reality. And as a conclusion, we know this bug can never happen. Um, and there's an example here um, from the QSpin lock. And the, the, the bad behavior that we're worried about is that the thread is stuck forever here reading the zero. And now we will look at this kind of, um, we try to construct all of the graphs and we construct everything basically based on that. We, we end up with this. And the only question that is kind of open is, what is the order between the two stores to the locked bit? So there's one here initializing it to zero and another one which is supposed to set it to one. And we figure out if the one that sets it to one comes later, then we will definitely eventually see that update and we will not be stuck in this loop forever because we will eventually see that one. So the only case in which we can be stuck in here forever is the one in which the locked bit is overwritten by this kind of initialization store. And so this coherence edge should go in this direction saying that this is the logical order and this one came last. And now we try to look and look and look and we find all of the HB edges um, and we see, oh, that's quite bad. There's no cycle here whatsoever. So I put all of the HB edges in here, and we can see we can never reach back the same node. We, the longest we can go is from here to here. That's it. And so according to the LKMM, this behavior can happen. And so we found our bug. Um, but that doesn't help us immediately fix it, right? But what will help us fix it is the observation that there's another kind of cycle in here. And that cycle is if we follow here the program order, then we have here reads from program order and coherence. And then we're back here at this point. And this kind of cycle is always forbidden by the sequential model. 
And we can use this knowledge because it means whenever we have this kind of cycle, if we add just the right amount of barriers along the events on that cycle, we can make this cycle also forbidden in LKMM and we can prevent the bug in LKMM. So in this case, we know either this, 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 or this operation need to be strengthened with some barrier and then the bug will disappear. And in this case, we already know uh, if we put the release store here, then the bug will disappear. And that is because we get a new HP edge going from here to here. Why? Well, we need to read the model to know that. And then we get this cycle and the cycle says, okay, LKMM says this behavior can no longer happen. Okay. But of course, that's completely like insane. Like you have to read this huge uh, model. You have to look at the graphs manually, inspect everything. So what do we do instead? In practice, uh, in my company where I work, we use some electronic helpers to actually do all of that work for us um, automatically. And there are two main tools that are now quite ready for, for use in real code. One of them is called GenMC, and the other one is called uh, D'Artagnan. And I'll try to give a short demo of the D'Artagnan tool. Um, so I'm running now the code directly on the real queue spin lock, not on the tiny example I've shown before. Um, I'm using the Linux kernel memory model that is specified here, LKMM. Um, and now it starts running, and what it will do is it will generate all of these graphs that could create a hang or other kind of bug um, in the skew spin lock. So each iteration here is one graph where bad behavior could happen, and each time it will find, okay, the behavior cannot happen. Except uh, on the 34th one, it actually says um, there is a bug, and this is the current version of queue spin lock in the current repository, so this is not the old version. So we know there's some safety violation according to the LKMM on the real Q spin log in the Linux code right now. And you saw it took like just a couple of seconds to find, not three years. Um, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, but it just tells us fail, right? No, that's not true. It also gives us the graph according to which the problem happens. That graph is quite huge. Um, but if you like have the time, you can go through this graph and figure out where the problem is. Or you can use another tool to do that automatically. Okay, and so what happened here, we have the current queue spin lock code, and according to the tools, there's a bug in it. Well, there are three possibilities, basically. Either there's really a bug in the queue spin lock code. Luckily, we have analyzed it, and on the hardware models, if you compile it, there's no problems. So that issue we can clear up. The second possibility is that the tool may be implementing the model incorrectly, and even though the model says that there's no problem, the tool has a bug and accidentally mentions this, we can also rule this out. Or the model may be a little bit too conservative in order to protect people from doing stupid things, and really says that there's a bug here, and this is the case. So depending on where the issue is, you, can, you have to adjust um, either the model or adjust the tool or maybe adjust the code, which is the most likely thing in, in, to happen in this case. Okay, and that brings me towards the end of the talk, and I just want to show a few more interesting examples of what can happen according to the Linux kernel memory model. Um, and the first one um, is basically what I call a relativistic frame of reference. And we have here this code with four threads, and the first one writes to X, the last one writes to Y, and the others, they read from X and Y. And now what we will do is we will look at one particular execution where CPU2 reads the update from CPU1 and then executes this RMB, which is a read memory barrier, which provides ordering between these reads. So we expect that these reads should be definitely executed in, in the order they're written in the program. Um, so we actually get this HB edge. And then CPU2 executes the read once, but it reads the old value of Y. It reads zero from the initial store. It doesn't read the more up-to-date one. So the logical order here is that the read once of Y happen, uh, logically occurred before CPU4's uh, store. And CPU4's store, in turn, logically occurred before the read once of CPU3 because it sees the value of 1. And then CPU3 executes a read memory barrier, again, ensuring that the order between these two reads should be exactly as written in the program. And then we can ask, what do we know about the read ones of X in relation to the right ones of X, right? And to summarize, we know logically the right ones of X happened before this read. This read definitely happened before this read because of the read memory barrier. Then the read ones here logically happened before CPU force, right? Because we read the old value. And CPU force 
write logically happen before CPU 3's read, which again happened before CPU 3's other read because of the read memory barrier. But that shouldn't mean that we will definitely see the up-to-date value of X here, right? And that's not the case. Yeah, I see people shaking their heads. Very nice. And that is not the case. Actually, according to LKMM and actual hardware, it's possible for the read ones of X to still see the outdated value. And the way to make sense of this, from my point of view, is to say, okay, each CPU actually has a different view of the order of the writes to X and Y. And CPU's two view is that the write to X happened before the write to Y, and CPU 3's view is that the write to Y happened before the write to X. So it's a little bit confusing maybe in the beginning, but that's memory models for you. Okay, now the next interesting uh, example um, can be explained at hand of Futurama, which is another very great show. And in that show, there's a young handsome guy called Fry, and he travels back in time and meets a young lady, and they have a son together, and that son meets another uh, young lady, and they also have a son who happens to be Fry. And so in short, Fry happens to be his own grandfather. And the same kind of thing can actually happen in LKMM. And here's the example. Um, and it's a little bit complicated. We'll just focus on the core part in the middle for now. Um, and there we have basically CPU 1 copying a value from A into B and CPU 2 copying a value from B into A. And when CPU 1, and one way to see this is basically here, the B value stored by CPU 1 will be 42 somehow. And it travels back in time and meets a beautiful read here. And the read has a store using its value. And that store gets read by another read, which has another store reading its value, which is 42. And so we have this value B equal 42, which is nowhere in the program, um, just being generated by this store to B here, copied over and over, and eventually ending back to itself, which is how the store to B equal 42 came to be in the first place. Um, and one way to, to see why this can happen is that we're using unmarked accesses here. And as I mentioned before, unmarked accesses in LKMM have very, very little guarantees. And in fact, um, what the compiler is allowed to do to this B equal A assignment is to insert a trashy store B equal 42 right before. Why would the compiler do that? In reality, there's no good reason, but in theory, you could imagine that it wants to prefetch the cache line of B in exclusive mode so it stores some trash value so it can parallelize the load from A and the fetching of the cache line of B. And then when the load of A is done, it can immediately store to that cache line because it already has it in exclusive mode. And the reason this doesn't happen is because we have prefetch instructions that do this for us without having to store. But in theory, on an architecture that doesn't have that kind of instruction, something like this could happen. And so you can see on unmarked accesses, store, uh, the compiler can really introduce some crazy things and make crazy things happen. And so the takeaway for basically everyone in the audience is tr don't try to be smart by using some plain stores whenever you have racy accesses because there are already um, LKM and primitives which are marked and guarantee no such thing happens that if everything goes right, generate exactly the same code as a plain copy unless the compiler somehow optimizes it um, in a crazy way, which would be completely okay for sequential code, but for racy concurrent code will just bring you a world of trouble. Okay. And that brings me basically to the conclusion of the talk. So, like I mentioned, the LKMM is a graph-based abstraction that predicts if bad things can happen. Uh, modern platforms have lots of crazy behaviors that we cannot easily manually predict, um, or even for experts are hard to predict sometimes. And so the right way to write any kind of concurrent code that doesn't use only locks is to use the tools because they're now powerful enough to actually run on real, real code, like the QSpin lock. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, I'm very happy to hear any questions. Yes, uh, there's a microphone there, so, here. Uh, uh, all right. A couple of years ago, I read, uh, read a paper uh, 
that said that uh, everything weaker than sequentially consistent is in principle undecidable. So perhaps I read it wrong or maybe, so, so I'm not sure if you, so my question is, is it like theoretically completely sound this model or is it just like a very best effort approach that should, you know, uh, should work well in practice? Okay, so your question is that since everything weaker than sequential consistency is undecidable, whatever that means. Um, proving, yeah, proving that a program is consistent. Okay, the, 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 the notion in that paper was that if you want to prove that the program is consistent, and the program has uh, weak, uh, is correct, uh, and the program has weak memory model, then in, in, th in principle, it's an undecidable problem, like a problem of stop. Yes, so, so let me try to, to repeat your question for the online audience and then try to give an answer from my point of view. So your question is, um, since sequential consistency is the only model under which we can decide certain things without clarifying what those certain things are, um, are these weak memory models really sound or are they just the best effort? Okay, and the, the thing is, I think there are lots of levels of abstraction that are being mixed here. Like, um, one of them is what exactly is the thing that is the problem that is being un that is undecidable. So we already know program verification in general is undecidable, even for sequential consistency, right? Like halting problem and so on. Um, but then there's a simpler problem, which is if you look only at finite state machine programs instead of full Turing machines, then for sequential consistency, you can get decidability, and indeed for many weak memory models, you don't. But that is luckily um, not the problem we have to solve, because we don't have to look at arbitrary finite state programs and arbitrary Turing machine programs. We have to look at very, very practical programs. And even though maybe in general it's impossible to decide the correctness of certain programs on weak memory models or even sequential consistency, for practical programs and maybe some practical correctness properties that we care about, we can very well decide. Like you could see we ran the thing on the Q-spin lock and it decided within like 20 seconds there's a bug, okay? Now the next question is, um, are the weak memory models themselves a kind of best effort thing or not? And the answer is that we can actually do weak memory model proofs all the way down to the architecture. So I have done this uh, very recently some proofs at the gate level construction of, for example, the Boom open source load store unit, which implements the weak memory model of the RISC-V architecture in the Berkeley out of order machine. And you can prove that that processor correctly implements the weak memory model, which means that the weak memory model that is written in the manual is sound at least for that processor. And then you can build this kind of tower where you say, okay, now we have the architecture level, but we have one level on top, which is the LKMM. And then we have the LKMM, mapping to this lower level using some compiler um, intrinsic, some assembly code that is, has been handcrafted. And we can also prove that that level is also sound. So the compiler things are, are correct. And actually in the LKMM, um, Victor Vafayadis recently found uh, an unsoundness, but only one, when mapping to power. But you can fix it and then prove, okay, the fix is sound. So, the model itself is definitely not just the best effort kind of thing. And the tools, I would say, are best effort kind of thing, but usually in practice, the best effort is good enough. I hope that answered your question. Okay, any more questions? Yes, yes, please. I like your questions. <laughs> Be kind of simpler, but I'm not sure it's possible to answer it, so. Uh, I was working for a company pre producing ARM V8 chips and they had some internal benchmarks that, pr that were proving that the weak memory model is in some cases worth the effort. So, but uh, mm. there are very little uh, like strong arguments uh, backed by numbers that would show that the whole uh, you know, issue is really worth the effort. I mean, yeah. the, uh, so the, what's your opinion on that? So this is a really, really great question. It and we've kind of great pain, right, for programmers. <laughs> and me, we, we had the same issue like you, like, like with the Linux kernel, we had like years old code that we found bugs in, right? Yeah, so this is a, a really great question. So your question is, are weak memory models really worth the effort in terms of performance? And so th there's two parts of the answer. One of them is that we have some concurrent accesses in the code, like 
these write ones, write uh, read ones, SMP, write release, and so on. But they actually make up a really, really tiny fraction of the code that we really run. And 99% of the time, we run some plain accesses using some kind of local logic. And actually, that part is the part that the weak memory model is for. So the weak memory model doesn't really help those concurrent accesses, but it helps us execute these other accesses out of order. And there are some performance benefits for that. So the company I work for also produces ARM chip, and we have also some benchmarks proving that there's some benefit, especially if you have long pipelines and huge out-of-order speculation windows. Um, and then for this kind of local code, you get a benefit. Now, the other thing is that we have done some previous work automatically choosing the optimal barriers for these kind of less than 1% of concurrent accesses. So this was the vSync work um, we published uh, some years ago. Um, and what we found is that even though we could get really, really nice performance benefits in some micro benchmarks, really stress testing that kind of concurrent data structure, if you put it in a real product, then you're optimizing less than 1% of the runtime, and it doesn't matter anymore. So my feeling now is that in reality, weak memory models are very important to optimize all the plain accesses, but the barriers you choose for the marked accesses almost never matter. And there you can almost always just go with sequential consistent accesses. And then that brings us back to your previous question. Um, then you get something, if you only really use these kind of sequential consistent accesses for those parts, then you get something that's called DRFSC theorem, which says then your whole program will behave as if it was sequentially consistent. And then you could use, in theory, sequentially consistent tools to verify. But we have not found really a good uh, need for that in our company. More questions? All right, thanks so much. Hope I didn't put everyone to sleep. <laughs>